The leader of Yemen's Houthis issued a warning, stating that they would target U.S. warships if the U.S. continued to target the Iranian-backed militia. This comes as the U.S. set up a multinational force to counter Houthi attacks on commercial vessels in the Red Sea. The Houthis have been firing drones and missiles at international vessels in response to Israel's actions in Gaza. The U.S.-led security initiative involves patrolling the Red Sea to deter and respond to Houthi attacks. The leader of the Houthis threatened to target American battleships, interests, and navigation if the U.S. escalates further. The situation in the Red Sea has escalated due to the conflict between Israel and Hamas, with the U.S. and its allies against Iran and its proxies. The Houthis have disrupted a key trade route, and a multinational force, including the U.S., plans to conduct joint patrols in the Red Sea. The Houthi leader also warned against sending American soldiers to Yemen. Israeli President Isaac Herzog stated that Israel is willing to agree to a second humanitarian pause in fighting with Hamas in exchange for the release of more hostages held by the militant group. Hamas, which is considered a terrorist organization by the US and EU, still holds around 129 of the initial 240 or more people abducted from Israel during its October 7 attack. Herzog made the offer, involving a one-week pause in fighting and the release of specific groups of hostages, through Qatari mediators. The proposal was conveyed by David Barnia, the head of Israel's Mossad spy agency, in meetings in Warsaw with Qatar's prime minister and the head of the CIA, Hamas has expressed a willingness to engage with any initiative contributing to ending aggression but rejected negotiations on prisoner exchanges while the Israeli attack on Gaza continues. The situation comes amid reports of efforts to restart talks for another ceasefire, with the first one ending on December 1 due to disagreements. The US, along with France, Germany, and the UK, has called for a ceasefire, and the CIA director's recent visit to Warsaw indicates ongoing diplomatic efforts. The US and Denmark have reached a historic defense cooperation agreement, allowing American forces access to Danish military bases. Denmark will permit the permanent stationing of U.S. soldiers at the Karup, Skridstrup, and Aalborg bases, along with the storage of weapons and equipment on Danish soil. The deal, expected to be signed later this week, also facilitates closer collaboration in military activities, including training and logistics. This marks a significant departure from Denmark's long-standing policy against permanent foreign troops on its soil. The agreement is part of a broader effort by the U.S. to establish defense partnerships in the Nordic region, having recently signed similar accords with Finland and Sweden. Existing agreements with Norway and Iceland are already in place. The move is seen as a response to security concerns, including an increasingly aggressive Russia, and is expected to last at least 10 years. Approval by the Danish parliament is required before the agreement enters into force, a process expected to take about a year. A Russian court has fined Google 4.6 billion rubles, 50.84 million dollars, for its failure to remove what Russia deems fake information about the conflict in Ukraine and for not addressing extremist content and the distribution of what Russia terms LGBT propaganda. The fine is part of an ongoing dispute between Russia and foreign technology companies involving issues such as content, censorship, data, and local representation. Russia has intensified its stance on these matters since the invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. Google, part of Alphabet, has not yet commented on the fine. The penalty is calculated as a percentage of Google's annual turnover in Russia and follows similar turnover-based fines imposed in 2021 and 2022. Despite being a target of Russian authorities, Google's YouTube has not been blocked, unlike Twitter and Meta platforms Facebook and Instagram. Canada faces significant implications in the ongoing geopolitical challenge over Sweden's NATO membership. Turkey and Hungary are currently blocking Sweden's full NATO membership, and Canada plays a crucial role in a multinational brigade in Latvia, where Sweden's participation is contingent on its NATO membership. Turkey has delayed ratifying Sweden's membership due to security concerns related to Kurdish militants, linking approval to US and Canadian military technology sales. Canada has struggled to meet its commitment to establishing a full brigade in Latvia, partially attributed to geographical challenges and the absence of facilities. The brigade, expected to be fully operational next summer, aims to include Swedish troops once Sweden joins NATO. Canada has recently strengthened its Latvian contingent with the arrival of tanks and plans for modern anti-tank weapons. Former TV journalist Yekaterina Dantsova has officially entered the Russian presidential election scheduled for March, where Vladimir Putin is expected to secure another term. 
Dunsova, 40, has previously called for an end to the conflict in Ukraine and the release of political prisoners, including opposition leader Alexei Navalny. Putin, seeking a six-year term, faces no established opposition figure, and critics argue that the election lacks genuine competition. Dunsova's next challenge is to gather 300,000 signatures by January 31st to support her candidacy. Putin, who has been in power since 1999, enjoys high poll ratings, but Navalny's supporters view the election as manipulated and controlled by the Kremlin. Former European Central Bank Governing Council member Ilmers Rumsevics has been found guilty by a Latvian court of bribe-taking and faces six years in prison, along with asset confiscation. The court ruled that Rumsevics, 58, violated the law by accepting payments and a trip to Russia from shareholders of a now-defunct bank a decade ago. The sentence matches what prosecutors had sought. Rimsevics, who was arrested in 2018, will also serve probation and a five-year ban on holding public office. His arrest was part of a series of money laundering scandals in Latvia and Estonia. Rimsevics's downfall occurred after over a quarter century as governor or deputy governor of the central bank. The case involved allegations of deals in a remote sauna and solicitations of bribes. Rimsevics plans to appeal the verdict. Egypt has declared that a fourth round of talks regarding the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, GERD, on the Nile River has failed. Egypt's irrigation ministry criticized Ethiopia for refusing compromise solutions that would safeguard the interests of all three countries involved, Egypt, Sudan, and Ethiopia. Egypt accused Ethiopia of exploiting the negotiation process to establish an unregulated and absolute Ethiopian control of the Blue Nile. Previous discussions failed to produce tangible results, raising concerns for Egypt and Sudan about potential limitations on their access to the Nile's fresh water. Egypt's President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi, re-elected for a third term, emphasized the country's water rights as a red line and warned against any attempts to undermine them. Egypt retains the right to defend its water and national security in the event of harm caused by the GERD. Ethiopia responded, stating that Egypt's comments misrepresented the situation and accused Egypt of maintaining a colonial era mentality. Chinese President Xi Jinping reportedly told US President Joe Biden during their recent summit in San Francisco that China plans to reunify Taiwan with mainland China, but the timing has not been decided. She stated that China's preference is for a peaceful reunification, not by force. The Chinese leader dismissed predictions by U.S. military leaders about a specific time frame for taking Taiwan, emphasizing that he has not set one. Chinese officials asked Biden to make a public statement supporting China's goal of peaceful unification with Taiwan, but the White House rejected the request. She expressed concerns about the candidates in Taiwan's upcoming presidential election and noted the U.S. influence on Taiwan. Despite the tensions, both leaders aimed to reduce overall tensions between their countries during the summit. The death toll from China's recent earthquake, the most severe since 2014, has risen to over 130. The quake, with a magnitude of 6.2, struck rural areas of Gansu province and neighboring Qinghai, causing extensive damage to homes and infrastructure. Vice Premier Zhang Guoqing, a member of the Communist Party's Politburo, has been sent to oversee recovery efforts, following Chinese leader Xi Jinping's call to minimize casualties. Videos and images on social media depict collapsed homes, damaged roads, and relief efforts, including food kitchens and tents. Recovery progress is reported, with operational power lines and reopened rural roads. The affected area faces additional challenges with a cold snap, experiencing temperatures as low as minus 16 degrees Celsius 3 degrees Fahrenheit. China's western regions are prone to earthquakes, some of which have been devastating in the past. Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. signed the 2024 national budget, amounting to 5.77 trillion pesos, $103.5 billion, with increased allocations for defense and maritime security amid tensions in the South China Sea. The budget is 9.5% higher than the 2023 budget and emphasizes food security and logistics cost reduction. An additional 10.5 billion pesos have been earmarked to upgrade defense capabilities and enhance the nation's presence in the South China Sea. The Philippines has been actively challenging China's territorial claims in the disputed waters, escalating military and coast guard activities. Marcos highlighted the importance of securing borders and combating poverty and illiteracy in his speech. The budget excludes confidential funds for the office of Vice President Sara Duterte and the Department of Education. 
Philippine television regulators have suspended the TV program Gikan Sa Masa, Para Sa Masa, where former President Rodrigo Duterte regularly appears, citing violations of broadcast content standards. The suspension, imposed by the Movie and Television Review and Classification Board, will last for two weeks, effective December 18. The program airs on the SMNI channel and has been a platform for Duterte to express his views on various issues since the end of his six-year term in June 2022. The board received complaints about alleged death threats made on the show, leading to the suspension. Another SMNI program, Laban Kasama Ong Bayan, was also suspended for broadcasting unverified news about an alleged travel fund. The regulatory decision aims to prevent the possible repetition of alleged infractions that may negatively impact public welfare, ethical considerations, and the overall reputation of the broadcasting industry. President Joe Biden delivered a warning at a campaign fundraiser, emphasizing the importance of Democrats rallying to defeat Donald Trump in the 2024 election. Biden stressed that the stakes go beyond individual politicians, stating, if we lose, we lose everything. He likened some of Trump's rhetoric to that of Nazi Germany and highlighted the former president's use of government for revenge and retribution against his enemies. Biden framed the 2024 election as a crucial moment for saving American democracy, while acknowledging the stark alternative if Democrats do not prevail. The president also commented on Trump's recent statements, including quoting Russian leader Vladimir Putin, and dismissed polls showing him trailing Trump, emphasizing the variability in poll results. The Colorado Supreme Court ruled that former President Donald Trump is ineligible to seek the presidency, ordering the removal of his name from the state's Republican primary ballot. The decision was based on a clause in the 14th Amendment prohibiting individuals engaged in insurrection or rebellion from holding office. The court determined that Trump's role in the January 6 Capitol riot justified barring him from the presidency. The ruling faces likely appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. Critics argue the decision seems premature, emphasizing that Trump has not been convicted of any related crimes. The move raises questions about its impact on democratic processes and potential scenarios in the election outcome.